There's 100 million Americans who suffer from chronic pain, and over half of them feel ill-equipped to deal with their pain. So we're developing software tools to make pain management easier. I would like to let everyone know that our next group comes to us from Vancouver, Canada. They are with Kuros Labs. My back hurts. Who's heard that one before? But we're not surprised, right? Did you know that chronic pain affects more Americans than cancer, diabetes, and heart disease combined? I've had chronic pain for several years now. That's actually me on bench there. Just last week in Vancouver. I was out for a walk and my pain flared up again. I suppose I walked too far, or maybe too fast. But it could have also been something I did the day before. Often I can't pinpoint my trigger. Some days I can sit for hours, no problem. But then other times, 20 minutes in a chair and my back is in pain. Once I'm flared up, it can take a day or more to reset. I have trouble pacing myself. When I see my doctor, of course, she asks about my symptoms. How is my pain been? Especially before, during, and after the exercises she's doing. But I don't know what to say. I have pain every day. It comes and goes. It's always changing. I have trouble tracking my progress. I so badly want to get better. But faced with these challenges, I feel helpless. But soon, all of this is going to change. Because Kuros Labs is on a mission to empower every person with chronic pain to live the best life they can, with better solutions for pain management. So chronic pain is broadly defined as any pain lasting longer than 12 weeks. In America alone, there are 100 million people who have chronic pain, and they're ill-equipped to deal with it. This is an epidemic. It's costing the U.S. over $300 billion each year in productivity losses alone, and it's fueling an opioid epidemic that's running out of control. Healthcare providers can't fight this battle alone, but now there can those in pain. Over half of them feel, like me, like they have little or no control over their pain. Now, if these numbers surprise you, consider the nature of pain. It's invisible, highly personal. There is no test in the world that can measure it precisely. So it's up to the person in pain to be their own best advocate and figure out what works. Pain management isn't easy. Tracking everything you're doing and feeling, finding patterns, figuring out what works, it's exhausting. I know this, and we validated this idea with 100 patients and practitioners in this space as well. We can't mandate around-the-clock medical support for 100 million people in pain. What we can do is make better tools for in-between medical visits, and that's where Curos Labs comes in, with its first product, Checkpoint. It's a mobile pain coaching service specifically designed for people with chronic pain. So Checkpoint enables effortless pain tracking on your smartphone or smartwatch. It automatically collects activity data like movement, sleep, and heart rate. Factors which are scientifically proven to correlate with pain. It will also pull data from your phone, like your location and calendar events, to better understand what's going on, both when you're in pain and when you're feeling good. With all this data, Checkpoint can employ machine learning techniques to predict pain before it happens, identify alternative behaviors, and generally help you mitigate pain episodes before they get out of control. This is the tool we need to fight back against the chronic pain epidemic. So here's how it works. At strategic points in my day, I'll get a buzz on my wrist asking me how I'm feeling. In just five seconds, I can rate my pain, choose a description, and get back to whatever I'm doing. I just logged my pain right now. It's that easy. And if you don't have a smartwatch, you can do it on your smartphone too. And I've been doing this all week. Here's just a tiny snapshot of a little bit of the data Checkpoint was tracking while I was sightseeing in DC. Now I appreciate that this is a lot of data to take in, but that's the beauty of Checkpoint. It's passively collecting this data and I don't have to analyze it. It will pull insights for me, like the fact that I'm generally less active in the morning and that's contributing to a spike in my pain around midday. I spend the rest of my day trying to catch up on the pain by being more active. So in the future, Checkpoint can remind me to be more active in the morning and other things that it's helped me identify that aren't shown on this graph, like how meditation helps bring down my average pain week over week. This is changing my life.
Now, I suspect at this point you're wondering if there's any other products out there like this today. And we see our product operating within the offerings of three different industries. The first is activity trackers. These are the Fitbits and the Garmin's of the world. They do a great job of tracking your step count and your heart rate, but they don't know how you're feeling and they don't allow for user input information. So for someone with chronic pain, they don't work. Next is pain journals. Now, pain journals come in all shapes and sizes. They range from an actual journal with a pen to an app on your phone which tries to replicate this. Alex and I have personally tried all of these and find that they continuously come up short. They don't provide any useful analysis and they're very tedious to use. Next is healthcare. Now I want to really emphasize that we are not positioning ourselves to take over healthcare, but to supplement it. You see, a doctor can't check up on you daily or hourly, but Checkpoint can. And when it comes time to go and see your doctor, you have all the information you need. This is a summary of what we just presented. And as you can see, we are the only solution that provides day in, day out coaching to change behaviors and actually improve pain in someone's life. We have one direct competitor, and that is a wearable device by Spry Health. What they do is they monitor patients in a hospital setting. They'll provide warnings to practitioners when a pain flare-up might happen, but they don't provide the day in, day out coaching or analysis to change behaviors. We currently have freedom to operate and we plan to file for algorithm patents this fall to protect our venture going forward. So our market capture plan has three key phases. The first is a pilot phase. It's going to be a six-month pilot phase, and it's going to begin this fall in Vancouver and the Silicon Valley. This is characterized by high-touch interactions with our target customer to inform product features, user experience, and de-risk things in our product launch, such as pricing as well as adherence. Our new customers for this will come from clinics where we've already established relationships. These are clinics with high rates of chronic pain. Our next phase is our market entry phase. The goal of this phase is to prove the effectiveness of our product and gain initial users. So it will begin by launching Checkpoint on the Apple App Store so that anyone with chronic pain can purchase it for $10 a month. Following this, we will launch an Android device. A key activity for this time is that we are going to actually run clinical trials to prove the effectiveness of changing behavior with our product. Next is the enterprise sales stage. And this is when we scale our business dramatically. We're going to begin selling our solution to enterprises that have large absentee rates due to pain, to insurance companies, as well as to workers' compensation groups. The value proposition here is that we will support their employees or clients as they return to work and decrease lost productivity in the workforce. At this time, we will also explore the other applications of all this data that we're collecting. So our market size. We have an opportunity to affect the lives of 20 million Canadians and Americans when we go to market initially. And these are people who have chronic pain in an Apple Watch device. It's a $1 billion market. But as we scale to an enterprise model, we have the ability to affect the lives of 70 million Canadians and Americans living with chronic pain. I think that's amazing. It's going to be a $4 billion market. And the risks associated with these two markets are initially um, adherence and price sensitivity. But we plan to mitigate that in our pilot phase. With our enterprise sales, the risks are first customer capture. But we aim to prove the effectiveness of our product and gain users before that so that we can enter that market. So our business model. We're going to be building this in-house with software engineering. We'll also have business alliances, which will include working with practitioner networks. They are the disseminators of information to practitioners. So they share new products, what's going on, research, and practitioners and physical therapists are our greatest influencers. Our marketing channels will change as we scale. They'll begin by building awareness in clinics, local pain groups, as well as some online marketing and influencer marketing. But as we scale to an enterprise sales model, that is when we will have a direct B2B sales force as well as online content marketing. Finally, our end user will change as well. Originally, it is people with chronic pain who are going to purchase this application for a $10 a month subscription service. But as we scale, the enterprises will pay for it and it will be a tiered pricing. For the next few years for our venture, we require $600,000. Our revenues in year one are going to be $40,000. Our revenues in year two will be $210,000. Our revenues in year three will be $2.6 million. To achieve this, we have an average month-over-month -month growth of 18%. And at the end of year three, our gross margin is 75%.
Today, Tristan and I are the two co-founders of Kiros Labs, Inc. Between the two of us, we have over a decade of experience personally living with chronic pain. One of us has recovered, and one of us is on the road to recovery. And we see this as one of our greatest strengths in pursuing our mission to empower other people with chronic pain. Our backgrounds are quite complementary in engineering and business, with experience leading biomedical software projects, running clinical studies for ultrasound tech, and also working, working in marketing at one of Canada's largest software as a service companies. We are seeking a third business development co-founder to round out our skill set to help bring our product to market and growth hack our business. We are seeking $90,000 for the six month pilot phase that Tristan previously described. Today's top prize would bring us 30% of the way towards that goal and be a significant bargaining chip in accessing the rest of the funds needed back home. Adequate funding for this pilot phase is absolutely crucial as we prepare for a $500,000 seed round next year. So here we are, nearing the end of our time in Virginia. I have to admit something. Before I came here, I wasn't sure how my back pain would be. So much to see and do here. I, don't, I knew I couldn't be my own full-time pain coach, but I didn't have to be. Because I've had a checkpoint on my wrist all week. It's been helping me keep on track. It's been monitoring what I'm doing and nudging me along in the right direction when my pain flares up, or even better, before that happens. I took control of my pain. And with your vote, we can empower 100 million Americans to do the same. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very good presentation. Um, I want to make one statement. I, just, I would be careful going to Silicon Valley in the sense of um, that's a double-edged sword sometimes. Be really careful with that, where I think Vancouver is one of the greatest cities. So you, have a great, you do. You have a great city to really to really try to get this thing really going. So I would just think that through before you did that. I just want to put that out there. Uh, how much, what's it going to cost for the clinical trials? Because by saying that, I mean, if you come out where doctors and nurses were buying into this, um, then you have, a, you have the experts in the field saying, this is what you should use. So have you thought through the exact cost of those? So the question is, uh, what are the anticipated costs uh, associated with running these clinical trials? Uh, and to answer that, I will say, thanks to my prior experience uh, running clinical trials, I've developed a network around Vancouver, some of the top medical researchers, kind of MD, PhD types, that are involved in exactly this kind of research. So as far as Vancouver goes, we are well connected there and ready to partner with research institutes there. As for the Silicon Valley, uh, as it happens, I'm an incoming Stanford student for graduate studies there, and uh, am aware of a number of uh, key thought leaders in chronic pain research there, for whom we've actually conducted, well, we conducted some of our background research by reading their papers and intend to collaborate with them once we're down there to leverage their uh, resources and make this cost a cost-effective process. We won't hold it against you. <laughs> At tech, it's all right. <laughs> um, at $10 a month, how are you going to support the te technology challenge customers like my mother's 86 and is, is having severe back issues um, and there's going to have to be some kind of training but also support phase. How are you, what are your plans on that? So the goal of Checkpoint is really to make managing and analyzing and understanding your chronic pain as easy as possible. And we spoke to some of our competitors who are really, really tedious and hard to use. So we don't envision a, a lot of issues with that. Another point is that chronic pain actually affects every age group equally. And there's been studies to, to show that the distribution of chronic pain is, is from everyone such as our age to elderly people as well. So we believe there's a big enough market throughout those age groups. Uh, how many data points are you collecting other than, you know, you have the tracker system, a bunch of them. So are you just collecting the time when it pains and correlate with the other activities? Uh, that you're doing throughout the day? So the question is, how much data are we really collecting? Yeah, is it and the answer is, uh, as far as background activity tracking goes, uh, the heart rate can be measured uh, many hundreds of times in a single day with the Apple Watch. Uh, your, your phone will, by default, 
uh, update your step count every five or 10 minutes throughout the day based on your activity levels. As for the pane, that does require user input. By default, when a user begins to use the device, Checkpoint will check in with them every half an hour and then scale that interval up and down based on the person's specific pain profile. If there's someone who has quick spikes in pain that change erratically, Checkpoint would like to check in more often until it gets a better idea of the injury. For some people where they have kind of a constant dull pain, Checkpoint will try to bother them less. The idea is that it's as minimally invasive as possible. So it's just more about tracking, but if you have a pain, you are not alerting anybody, family member, doctor, or anybody. You just, just sit like you had in the photo. Right, so the follow-up question being, uh, could, uh, what, what's done with that data in real time? Right, so that's where we differentiate ourselves from something like Spry Health, which is really an emergency alert ban. Our, our technology is helping someone in their day-to-day -day life uh, get back to their normal activities and help them uh, manage day-to-day, -day, uh, yeah, activities. <laughs> so th this is a data analytics company, right? With, and it's dependent on someone put, getting the Apple Watch on someone's wrist, right? So I, the, my observation of that is in, in healthcare, as things shift, in, in, at least in this market, in the U.S. market, from fee-for-service to fee-for-outcome, with shared risk, it seems like you could you could jump off of your making the consumer pay ten dollars to having the health system buy the watch and the app and issue it to chronic care patients because the if you can keep them out of the emergency room once, um, you've made a hundred times your money. Um, so so is that I mean have you have you explored that sort of alternative models because I think adoption could be slow. If you're asking somebody to pay $10 a month and get a watch, um, that might not be their thing anyway because you're spread across so many demographics in the pain world. The one single thing that's common to all those people is that there's likely somebody who's on the hook for their care that has an economic incentive to do something different. Which one is that? Yeah, so just to clarify, the question, as I understand it, is that, um, you know, have we considered larger markets that, such as insurers, who will actually pay for this device instead of the end user to grow quicker? And, um, you know, that's exactly what, what we're trying to do here. So we have this market entry phase where we're growing through single users, and we recognize that that's slow. But we want to use that to prove effectiveness and, and gain some initial traction. What we want to do is we want to transition to enterprise sales. So selling to the insurance companies, you're talking about workers' compensation and large enterprises. And uh, really interesting, just recently, Apple, uh, it was announced that uh, Aetna is looking to purchase Apple Watches for um, well, 23 million members. And um, so this is really a, a growing trend that, um, you know, the, the pro pro proliferation of smartwatches. And, um, and this is something that we see is really to our advantage. I think the question was, you have to have the watch and the phone. Is it both or either or? Uh, so to answer the question, to use any smart watch like this, you do need a smartphone. But you only need a smartphone to use this technology. So bare minimum, you need a smartphone to use it. Uh, if you happen to have a smart watch through your insurance provider or you bought it yourself, that's fantastic. You can log pain events on your wrist. I was just wondering what, um, how are you going about to validate the product and to show, show us that you can make a difference in the market and in healthcare? Uh, you know, more specifically, I'm trying to, to visualize how are you, how are we using all the information, all the analysis, who's looking at it, who's processing it, who's taking the next step? Yeah, so the question as I understand it is, um, uh, first of all, I guess, uh, so how are we using this information? Who is using it? And what, what purpose will it be put towards? 
Okay, yeah, so this, I mean, this product came from our experience with, you know, tracking, trying to track pain, trying to understand our pain, just having nothing that did that. So um, what we're really solving is that tracking and analyzing and then having predictions for the Pearson. So if I'm using Checkpoint, I will track my pain, it will analyze it, and through machine learning, and it will be predictive and tell me, you know, what do I need to do? Do I need to meditate in the morning? Do I need to go for a walk in the morning to decrease my pain level? So it really lives with me, allows me to take control of my pain. So you do that, but it tells you, throws all that information to you, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, in a very, like, an easy to use way is, is the idea, exactly. In the event that you did, for some reason, want to share that data with your healthcare provider, of course it would all be available to the user to do everything they want with it. It's their personal health data. Could you go back to the slide, that your, your slide of your activity that you tracked? Um, okay. So on this graph, you're showing pain and you're showing activity. Is that as detailed as it gets? I mean, because there's a difference between walking, running, playing tennis, playing racquetball, you know, or for some people, just getting out of the chair they're sitting in eight hours a day is active. So, so the question is, how highly resolved can we measure activity? And is it, is, is it as good as active or inactive, or does it get better than that? The answer is it's far better than that. For the purposes of this illustration and telling a clear story in five seconds on this slide, I put a filter on the data so that if I logged more than such and such movement in a span of time, I said that was activity and otherwise below that would be inactivity, just for clarity of sight here. But in reality, the activity plot will look about as wavy as the pain plot, and in addition to that, we have heart rate almost every minute of the day and a whole bunch of other factors that a computer would have just an easy time processing as this, but to our human eyes, for the purposes of telling a story, I did simplify it. So can you, can, so can the person you're, you're, it's asking you questions and you're you know, typing in the answer, can you log specific Here's what I'm doing at this moment. I'm driving in my truck, sitting in a chair, versus sitting in my chair at the office. So that perhaps the pain trigger isn't necessarily sitting, it's sitting in what you're sitting. The truck versus the chair. And, I mean, can you get that detailed? Yeah, so the question is, does the user have the opportunity to add specific uh, de activity details that they don't suspect uh, checkpoint may be able to track? And the answer is totally yes. We offer two specific ways the user can do that right now. One is via manual text input on the phone, and the other being voice memos through the watch or the phone. Uh, and that way, there's no limit to what you can record. I'll just uh, add a caveat to that, that uh, many people in the room here will probably be surprised to know how much uh, your, uh, your smartphone can deduce what you're doing from a variety of factors. When it knows your location, how fast you're moving from your GPS, uh, as well as your habits, uh, most smartphones can tell whether you're driving in a car or on a bike or walking to the park. That's actually how Google traffic analytics work. It's tracking, pinging every smartphone in the car to do stuff like that. And we would use the same uh, type of technology. No more Google. <laughs> okay, we have time for one uh, online question. How are you protect protecting your customer data? Yeah, so um, we will require uh, PIPEDA and HIPAA data compliance for the United States and Canada. But the goal of Checkpoint is to own your own data so that it lives with you and it provides insights to you. And if I want to show a pain graph or a plot of you know my last four months when I finally get to see my doctor, I have the opportunity to do so and show her in a, a really simple way on my phone. Besides that, the data will live with me, provide me with insights to change my behaviors. see the presentations today. Uh, usually I look at them and in spite of what the judges say, I just give the awards to who I think should get them. But uh, this year we can't do that because I didn't, I didn't see the awards. So the first award we'd like to give is, is the $10,000 Information Technology Award. Are you interested in who? <laughs> How about Curios Labs from Vancouver, British Columbia?
Oh, sorry. <laughs>